I'm going to pray and I'm going to get us started in this message because I think that this is a, I think this is an important message and I think that, that the, the reason I, I feel kind of the way I do this morning is because of this message. I think that it's very important. So I'm going to pray and uh, we're going to get into this. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance to be here this morning. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the change that came uh, yesterday morning uh, that, that turned this whole message around from, from where it was going to what you want to say. God, I thank you for that. I just pray that this morning, uh, through this message, that you would be glorified, that Christ would be revealed, that we would see uh, some hidden secrets and some hidden truths in your word uh, that we may not have seen before, and that uh, we can walk out of here uh, with our eyes open this morning, God, that we can uh, enjoy what you've done for us through the cross, that, that we can enjoy the life that you've given us through Jesus Christ, that we can uh, be blessed and accept the blessing and uh, enjoy the blessing and inherit the blessing. And live abundantly in the blessing. We thank you for all of those things in Christ's name. Amen. So so this week, week's message is, is titled Sliced Bread. And it, it kind of tags on to, to where we were a couple of weeks ago when we talked about um, the, the people uh, wanting us to give them meat was what we talked about. And the, the people... Uh, they, they wanted meat. We talked in Numbers 11 where, where they went to, to Moses and they complained about everything was better back in Egypt before we came uh, out and, and, and while we were still under Pharaoh's rule. And, and it was great there because we had fish and we had meat. And man, we, we partied all the time and it was great. And they had a false perception of what life was like when they were back in Egypt. And so they complained to Moses because they were sick and tired of the bread that was falling down on the sky every night and laying there for them and being ready for them to eat when they woke up the next morning. They were tired of that. They wanted something different. They wanted some meat. And, and God, God said, okay, I'll give you some meat. And he gave them meat like four feet deep with the birds. And, and instead of them having an easy life of just getting up in the morning and going out and taking the bread that was there that fell out of heaven and bringing it back to their house and, and making food out of it and making cakes and making all of these things that were delicious to eat. And now they had to go out and kill birds and they had to uh, take the feathers off the birds and they had to clean the birds and they had to go through this whole process and it wasn't just like one bird. It was a lot of birds and they had to preserve the birds and the birds were getting rotten and the birds tasted bad in their mouths. And all of these things that they wanted or they thought they wanted in, in lieu of what God was providing for them. And so we talked about that uh, being like today's uh, today's attitude that, you know, sometimes when we get into scripture, uh, rather than just having the simplicity of the gospel, rather than just having the simplicity of who Jesus is, we want a little bit more. God, give us a little meat. I want to know how I'm supposed to live my life. I want to know what I'm supposed to do. I want to know how, how can I earn uh, what you say the Bible gives me. And, and it's kind of the same thing uh, that, that the Israelites were doing, uh, but it's in a spiritual nature now in the New Testament. Because we know that the Old Testament, all, the, all the, the physical things that happened in the Old Testament were little pictures of spiritual things that are happening in the New Testament. So today's message is called sliced bread, because there ain't nothing better than sliced bread. We all know that, and, and without sliced bread, America wouldn't be the way it is today. We couldn't have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We couldn't have peanut butter and fluff. We couldn't have grilled cheese. We couldn't have all those things without sliced bread. So the sliced bread is important. And our main text is from Luke 24, verses 28 through 35. And, and, but we're going to start in John 6, 35, because I think it's important to know who Jesus is. Sometimes we forget who Jesus is. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I love that he puts those two together. I love that he says, I am the bread of life. And if you come to me, you'll never hunger. But if you come to me, you'll also never thirst. Because like bread sometimes can make you thirsty when you're eating a sandwich. But if you have the Jesus bread, then you're not going to be thirsty. You're going to be satisfied, fully satisfied all the time. Even in the Old Testament, when the bread fell down, it landed. When the manna came down from the sky, it landed on, on the dew. And the Bible says the dew came down and the manna came down and rested on top of the dew. So it was almost like a picture of this. There was water and then there was bread. And it's these two things that go together. And I just love it. I love that, that Jesus says this, that he clarifies to all of us that he is the bread of life. Because in the Old Testament, this bread that was falling down out of heaven, they called it manna. And really what, it, what that translates to from, from the Hebrew word is, what is it? They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what to call it. So they basically called it a whatchamacallit. They, they, they said, I don't know what it is. We'll just call it what is it. And so that's kind of 
like Jesus. He, a lot of times we get into scripture and we see this gospel and we're like, what is it? Is it, can it, can it be true? Can this be real? Who is this Jesus? What is this Jesus? What has he done? How does he act? What does he want? All of these questions that we have are, are wrapped up in him. He is the bread of life. He gives us the simple answer, the simplest answer of all. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. I love never. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Never. I love never. Underline never. So we, we jump into this story ahead in Luke 24, 28 through 35. And I'm just going to give you the, the back line because we kind of come in towards the end of the story. What had happened was, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> they had, Jesus had, had been crucified back in Jerusalem. Everybody's like, what had happened was, well, Jesus had been crucified back in Jerusalem. And he, and he died and he, and he went to the grave. And, and there was a, a great... Uh, stirring up with the disciples and with his followers and with the believers and with the whole the whole community because this this man who had had gone out and healed people who had raised the dead who had given sight to the blind who had given hearing to the deaf who had done all of these miracles who had fed thousands of people and who was just loving to everybody had been killed he had been scourged, he had been beaten, he had been ridiculed, he had been sold out by his friends, he had been uh, condemned to death on a cross, and he died and he went to the grave. And the people had this mindset that, man, this, this guy, he's going he's gonna to restore Israel back to what Israel is supposed to be. He's going to make Jerusalem the, the king city. He's going he's gonna to sit on the throne, he's going to be the king, and he's going to bring his rule and his reign, and then, and then he goes to the cross, and then people were confused, and they were confused because they had not fully understood the scriptures that they had been taught their entire lives. They had been told over and over and over again by the prophets that this was going to happen, and Jesus himself told them over and over again, this is going to happen, and the, but they didn't want to believe it. It's like they were blind to what was about to take place. They were blind to the words in the Old Testament scriptures. They hadn't, they hadn't actually gotten into those scriptures. They had heard them. They had recited them. They had memorized them. They had written them on the doorposts of their heart and then on their houses, and they wore them around their necks. They did all of these things, but yet they didn't know that those scriptures said these very things would happen to this man. And they, they totally forgot that. They thought something totally different was going to happen. They thought he was just going to rule and reign and put an end to the Roman control of their country and do all of these things. So he dies. And he, he raises again. And this is after his resurrection. So these two people are walking down the, down the road together. They're going from, on a journey from Jerusalem down the Emmaus Road. And it's a seven-mile walk that they're going on. And out of nowhere, this dude appears. And they don't know who he is, but they're, they're talking. They're, the two of them are talking about, man, I can't believe what happened back in Jerusalem. Can you believe they crucified Jesus? And, and man, I thought it was going to be better than this. And I, I thought he was going to save Israel. And so Jesus comes up. I'm paraphrasing the whole chapter, by the way. Jesus comes up and, and he's, like, he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And, but they don't know it's Jesus. He's kind of disguised himself. He's like, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, man, have you not heard what happened in Jerusalem? You know, this guy was supposed to be, he's going to take over, and he's going to be the king, he's going to do all these great things, and now he's dead. And so now we're, we're like depressed, and we're going back. And so we're walking, and we're, we're, we're just talking. And so Jesus starts to have a conversation with them, and he, he starts to talk to them about himself, but he doesn't tell them who he is. He keeps himself hidden. He, he hides their eyes from seeing him as Jesus Christ. And instead, he goes back to the Old Testament scriptures and he starts talking about all of the things concerning himself, the Bible says, from the law and the prophets. And I love that he does that because this is how the New Testament church is supposed to reveal Jesus to the world. It, if we don't, we're not, this is, we are to go into the Old Testament and draw out from the law and the prophets all the things concerning Jesus. And see, what we've done is we've turned it into the law and the prophets. We want to pull out all the things concerning us. 
Well, how does this apply to me? How do I fit into that? What do I need to do? And we go right back to this meat attitude, this give me some meat, man. Give me, some, give me something other than this bread. When in reality, we're supposed to be going to the law and the prophets to find the bread. Is what we're supposed to be looking for there. So Jesus walks seven miles with these people. And he talks the whole time. I can only imagine what that conversation was like. It must have been interesting. He must have pulled some scriptures out that these people were like, Dude, I've never heard it like that before. Man, I've never heard anybody say that before. He, they, that must have been the conversation the whole way. So they get to the point where they're getting near the village where they were going. And that's where we're going to pick up this story. In Luke 24, verse 28. They drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him. They held him back. I love, I even this is, this is awesome. This is, this is God's grace right here. They constrained him. This word, I looked it up earlier this morning. It means that they actually physically held him back. They, they, they stopped Jesus Christ from going where he wanted to go. And so it's really cool. Saying, abide with us for it is toward the evening, and the day is far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. It's awesome. That he, they, they, he wanted to go on. And, and they said, no, stay with us. And they, they, they held him and they were like, stay with us. Chill out with us for a little while. Don't go on any further. The day's over. It's getting dark outside. There, there, there might be clowns in the shadows. So, so just, you know, chill out with us tonight. Stay here and, and, and hang around with us. And so Jesus, Jesus goes ahead and he stays with them. And I, I just want you to highlight this, that they were tired. They, they didn't want to go any further. They, had, they were depressed. They were worn out. They, they were sad. They were tired. And Jesus wasn't. Jesus was like, let's keep going. We're, we're, we're listen. I want to tell you more. There's so much more that I want to talk about. Let's keep walking a little bit further. They said, no, we're tired, Jesus. I want to stop here. Will you stay with us? But they didn't know it was Jesus. They didn't say Jesus. So now it came to pass. They went inside. They found a place to eat. And it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And I, I've got, in, in my little notes here, I put a little parenthetical he's in there because there, there's five he's in here. And we'll read it the way, the way I like to read it. Now, it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, he blessed the bread, and he broke the bread. And he gave the bread to them. I love that he did it. Five, there were five little things that Jesus did. In, in, in numerology, in, in biblical terms, every number has a meaning. Every, every number, every, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a number. The number five, the letter for the number five is hey, and the number five is the number of grace. So Jesus five times does something in this one sentence. This is, this is just a little hidden secret. This is a little hidden treasure that, that you get this morning. It came to pass that first he sat down. He, uh, that shows that Jesus, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't tired, but he was resting. He said, I'll, okay, I'll sit down. I'm going to sit down. That shows that I'm done. I, I ain't got nothing to do. I'm going to sit down. Then he took the bread. He took what they had prepared. He took it to himself first. He blessed it. He said, God, bless this bread. Make this bread nourish their body. I don't know what he said. I don't know what prayer he offered over the bread. I don't know how he blessed the bread. Maybe he said, this bread will give you life. I don't know what he said. Then he broke it. And then all of these things just are a picture of his life. He rested at the cross. He took himself to the cross. He blessed the people when he went to the cross. He broke his body at the cross. And he gave himself to the world at the cross. He did all of these things. This is just a picture of what he just did at Calvary. He sat down. He, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, Jesus at one point in his, in his ministry, he says, he says, foxes have, have no place to lay, have a place to sleep, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And then when he goes to the cross... He, the Bible says that he, he gave up his spirit and bowing his head. And, and that was the same word for laying down, for finding a place to rest. The same word they use like foxes that have no place to rest. Jesus found his place to rest on the cross. He, he rested. He sat at the table with them. He took the bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread. And he gave it to them. And, then the, and, and so the next thing that happened was their, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. Something happened in the breaking of the bread. Something happened when Jesus, he was still shadowed from them. He was still disguised in his personal appearance as to who he was. 
But something happened when, when he took the bread and he sat down and he broke the bread and he breath, blessed the bread, he broke the bread and he handed the bread to them. Something happened in that moment and then their eyes were opened and they knew him. They knew who he was at the breaking of the bread, at the, at the revelation of who he was, he, they knew who he was. And then poof, he vanished from their sight and he was gone. And, and I, I love this, that it says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. Because in the Old Testament, in Genesis 3, verse 7, we see their eyes open for a different reason. See, in the Old Testament, in, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he made man, he put man on the earth, and he, he gave man a woman, and that was great. And, and then he, he said, don't eat from this tree over here, and because in the day that you do, you will surely die. And so they ate from the tree, and in the moment they ate from the tree, their eyes were open. But... In the Old Testament, their eyes were already open to God's grace. It, they were closed. They were hidden from God's laws and from the knowledge of good and evil. And in, in the New World, in the New Testament, after Adam, when, when the fall happened, our eyes are closed to God's grace. They are opened to the knowledge of good and evil. We are all born into the knowledge of good and evil. So then their eyes were open and they knew him. But Genesis 3, 7 says, then the eyes of both of them were open and they, they didn't know him anymore. They knew him before. They, they know, now they knew they were naked. This isn't good. Um, we're naked. And did you know we were naked? We've been naked all along. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. You see what happened? In the Old Testament, they knew good and evil. And so suddenly they knew they were naked. In the New Testament, at the breaking of bread, they suddenly knew Jesus. It, it just proves this whole, this whole thing that Paul writes later on in Corinthians that when, when we behold him, when we look at him, then we're transformed into his image. Then we, we know him with an unveiled face. But, but the old people with the veiled face, they, they don't know him right now. They can't see him because their faces are veiled. So at the breaking of bread, their eyes were open and they, and they knew him. They knew who he was. They were like, oh, that was Jesus. And then, poof, he's gone from their sight. He disappears. And so we carry on in verse 32. And they said to one another, now they have an interesting conversation with each other. Now, now they're like, whoa, what just happened? Did not our hearts burn within us? While he talked with us on the road. And while he opened the scriptures to us. Man, when we were walking with him, did, did you feel the same way I did? Were you not like, oh, man, I'm on fire right now. This guy's talking about all of these great things about Jesus from the Old Testament. And I never heard it like this before. And I never, I never knew all these things existed. And maybe Jesus opened up to them uh, Isaiah. And he opened up Isaiah 53 to them. And he, he said, yeah, by, by his stripes you are healed and all of these things. And they were like, man, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. I didn't know that that's what it meant. I thought he was going to be a Tasmanian devil. I didn't understand that he was going to be striped at the, at the scourging post of the Romans. Man, that, he opened that up. Man, that's awesome. And so their hearts burned within them as they heard him talk about himself. As they heard the message of the cross. As they heard the story of who Jesus was. Their hearts burned within themselves. They got lit on fire. They were excited about what they were hearing while he opened the scriptures about himself to them. So they, they were so, remember, remember where we were in verse 28, that they were tired, that they, they didn't want to go any further. They said, Jesus, let's sit down and stop, man. I'm tired. It's been a seven mile walk. I, my feet hurt. I want to sit down. I want to eat. I, I don't want to think about anything anymore. Look what happens after Jesus breaks bread for them. And it doesn't even say that they ate. It doesn't even say that they ate it. It just says that he did this symbolic thing for them. And they, they rose up that very hour and went seven miles back to Jerusalem. They turned around. They were so lit on fire. They couldn't contain themselves at all. They went from dead, dog tired, sit down, let's just rest here for the night because there's clouds outside, to let's get up and run back to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. They went, and they said, we have got to tell the disciples. We, isn't that awesome? These people who, who weren't, they, they weren't like the chosen twelve. They, these weren't out of the seventy that were sent out. These, these weren't the apostles. These, these weren't some special people that Jesus chose. They were, they were two people that were walking down the street. Maybe a husband and wife couple is what's assumed by it. They were two people walking down the street. These people went back 
to the people who Jesus chose. And they went back to the disciples to tell the disciples how awesome Jesus is. I think that's awesome. They found the disciples. They found the 11 together. And they said, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. You see, what had happened before all this was Jesus had risen from the dead. And the disciples, the very people who Jesus walked his three-year ministry with, and they saw everything that he did. And he told them specifically that he was going to Jerusalem to be crucified and handed over to the Romans and hung on a cross, and then on the third day he would rise again. The very people that he was the most intimate with did not believe that he rose from the dead. They didn't believe it. Even though they saw the tomb, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it when Mary and the other ladies came back and said, Jesus is gone from the grave. He's risen. They're like, no, he hasn't. You're crazy, lady. They didn't believe it. They were his chosen disciples, and they didn't believe it. So these two people, these two lay people, these two people who, who were not trained in, in, in gospel preaching or anything like that, they ran back to the disciples and they said, I'm telling you, I'm telling you today that Jesus is risen from the dead. The Lord indeed has risen and he did appear to Simon. Okay. And they told about the things that happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. How he was known to them in the breaking of bread. You see, I think that in the Old Testament, we talked about Numbers 11. And, and the people, they knew all about themselves. They knew all, they wanted to know. They know all about who they are, what they did, where they were going. They knew they were God's chosen people. They knew all kinds of stuff about themselves. But they, they didn't want the bread anymore. They wanted the meat. They wanted to know more about themselves. They wanted, they wanted to be, they wanted to be like they were back then. They wanted to be like those people over there. They wanted to be like everybody else. And, and I think that had they stopped for a minute and thank God for the bread that fell down every night, that they would have known him through the bread. They would have known who God was. They would have known who Christ was. They would have seen a completely different world than what they saw. And I think today we're in the same place, that, that we forget that the breaking of bread is, is not just a tradition that the church does. It's, it's not just some silly little thing that we do on Sunday mornings. It's, it's not just some insignificant part of church. And, and if you go to a church that, that, doesn't, that doesn't break bread ever, then you're missing out. Because it's in the breaking of bread that he was made known to them. And it's in the breaking of bread that they understood who he was. You see, that bread is, is symbolic to us of the breaking of his body, of who he was, of the fact that he, he gave himself, he broke himself, he laid himself down, he laid, no one takes my life, he said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay my life down for my friends. I lay my life down for you. See, in the, in the breaking of the bread, Jesus became known to his people. And I think we need to get into this. I think we need to understand that we need to slice the bread a little bit. We need to get into the Bible page by page. Man, it's sliced up. It's sliced up and ready for us to read. It's ready to go. But you, you can't get in there looking for something else. You can't look for the ham and the, and the cheeseburger and all the other stuff that's in the Bible. You've got to be looking for the bread because it's when you get into the bread, just like Jesus did with these two people on the road to Emmaus. He got into the Old Testament scriptures and he talked about himself from those scriptures. You see, he could have easily told these two people, and you, you know where you guys really screwed up along the way. You know, um, you know, you could really just, you know, be happier if you would do this, this, and this. You know, God's law says that you should um, live this way, and you should act this way, and you should not say these things. And, you know, you don't have to worry about anything else if you would live right, because if you would live right, you would have all of these things. He didn't do that to the people. He said, let me tell you why this law exists. Let me tell you why God said that it has to be a male lamb uh, with no spot and no blemish on its body. He, he pulled all those things out. He he talked about the tabernacle and he said, let me tell you why the ark itself is made of wood and overlaid with gold. He made, you know, that that's a picture of Jesus. He 
Wood represents the man, and the gold represents the righteousness of God. And so he was fully man, but he was fully God at the same time. But now let me tell you about the mercy seat, because later on, somebody's going to write about he became the propitiation for our sins. And that word means mercy seat. And so let me tell you about the mercy seat in the Old Testament. You see, the mercy seat was of hammered gold. It was one solid piece. You see, when Christ went to the cross, he gave up his manhood at the cross. He died right there, and he went to full God right there on the cross. He, he became the mercy seat on the cross. He became the propitiation for our sins on the cross. He was fully God. He was hammered gold at that point in time. He took the full wrath of God on himself. And you know what he did? He put himself over our failures. You see, inside, man, I, this is just my speculation. This is Jesus' conversation on the road to Emmaus with these two people. But maybe he said, remember the ark. Remember that God said, put, put the things, put the pot of manna that you refused inside the ark. And put the broken tablets of God's law that you broke inside the ark. And put the rod of Aaron that you rejected. You wanted a different priest, not the one that God chose for you. Put it inside the ark. And then God said, and put the mercy seat on top of that stuff. Because when God looks down on the ark, he wants to see the mercy seat. He doesn't want to see your faults and your failures that were laid in Jesus Christ when he went to the cross and died for your sins. He wants to see the solid, hammered, gold top that's on the ark. He can't see through what Jesus did anymore. He looks at Jesus and he sees perfection. And when he sees the perfection on top of the ark, he can't help but bless his people because he doesn't see their failures anymore. Maybe on the road to Emmaus, Jesus just expanded on the ark of the covenant. And these two people were like, oh my, man, I'm burning up inside. I feel excited today. I don't know what to do, but I got to go tell the disciples about this. That guy, he knew everything about Jesus. And <gasps> he was Jesus. That's why he knew everything about Jesus. I don't know. Maybe he talked about how the temple was built, how the, how the inner court was built, how the room that they laid the ark in was built, and that all the wooden posts around were covered with gold. You see, all of those wooden posts, maybe he said, all those wooden posts that were built around the ark of the covenant, those represent you, the people. Those represent the people. But you know what? I have covered you with my righteousness. So when you look at the ark, the ark reflects back to me what I see in myself on you. You see, when you're covered with gold, when you're covered with the righteousness of Christ, he can't help but look at you and see righteousness because he put his righteousness on you. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 21 says. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So when God looks at you, he sees the reflection of Jesus' perfect glory bouncing off of you. And he says, I can't help but bless that person because they're reflecting Jesus. Man, maybe that's what Jesus talked about on the road to Emmaus. I don't know. He might have talked about all kinds of stuff. Maybe he talked about bread. Maybe he talked about wine. Maybe he I don't know what he talked about on the road to Emmaus. But I bet it was a very, very, very interesting conversation. And I bet these two people, we, we interestingly enough, we don't ever hear about these people again. I wonder what happened to them when I read the Bible. I look at this story and I think, man, that's an awesome story. And they went back to the disciples and they told the disciples that he was made known to them at the breaking of bread. I wonder what happened to their lives after this incident. I wonder, I wonder how much they changed. I wonder, I wonder how many other people they influenced, how many other people they talked to, how many friends and family members and neighbors that they just said, man, we had the craziest conversation with this man on the road to Emmaus. It turns out he was Jesus and he was telling us all along who he was, but not showing us who he was because he was hiding who he was so he could tell us who he was from the scriptures because someday there's going to be a church that needs to expound from the scriptures all the things concerning Jesus because that's the only way we're going to get to know him today is to open up the Bible, to open up God's word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ, but now we have God's word. And the only way to get to know who Jesus is is to open it up and look for the things concerning Jesus. 
That's what we do when we break bread. We don't break bread to think about the things concerning us. We don't go up to the table and break bread and we think about how horrible we are. We go up to the table and we break bread and we think about how incredibly righteous Jesus is. And we thank him that he gave us that righteousness, that it's a gift of grace, that it is the gift of righteousness, not an earned righteousness. It, it can't be an earned righteousness. Even our righteousness is, is, is our like filthy rags before God. I can't say that word without putting too many S's on the end of it. But this so we, maybe, maybe the story was in here to show the New Testament church 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ how they ought to be looking at Scripture. It's not to find how to tell people to live right. It's not to find ways to correct people's behavior. It's to find Jesus Christ in the written word of God and proclaim him to the masses so that they can see what these people saw so that they can break bread. That's what we try to do here every Sunday. We want to break bread. That's what we're doing. We open up the scripture and we want to reveal Jesus. We want to be hidden. And we want him to be seen. We want him to know that he sat down. He took the bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread and he gave the bread. He did it five ways so that we can know we are saved through his finished work at the cross. He's known to us in the breaking of bread. Maybe this is a message about reading your Bible. Maybe this is a message about telling your neighbor who Jesus is. Maybe this is a message, I don't know, about having a, a new understanding for, for the communion that we, we celebrate every time we get together. Maybe it's just a message to get your heart burning inside so that you might want to go home and get in there and be like, man, I want to find out what he really said about the, the, the tabernacle and all those things. And I, I might be pretty neat to look into. That's kind of cool. And we can go into that for days. We can talk about the high priest. Maybe Jesus talked about the high priest while he was walking with these people and his garments and whatever little thing meant. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, the breastplate and all those things. Maybe Jesus did that with these people. I don't know. But what we want to talk about is we got to slice the bread. We, we got bread. We got a loaf. We got to slice it up and we got to give it out. It's time to start feeding some people some Jesus. They need to have an opportunity to sit down. If you're weary, if you're worn out, if you're tired, if you're depressed, if you're confused, if you're anxious, if you don't know what's going on, if you're like these two people on the road to Emmaus, and, and you don't want to go any further. And you're like, I'm done, man. I just want to sit down. I can't deal with this anymore. I got so much stress at work. I got so much stress at home. I got so much stress everywhere I go. I see things in the news. I hear things at work. I talk to people all the time. I, I just can't deal with it anymore. I want to sit down. Maybe it's time for you to break bread. Maybe that's where you'll get reinvigorated and, and, and re-energized to, to run back to where you were and say, man, there is hope. There's life. Light at the end of the tunnel. I promise you the light at the end of the tunnel is that ain't a train that's coming to get you. It's Jesus Christ that's coming to pick you up and redeem you and lift you up and put you back where you need to be. I know you're in the valley right now, but I promise you the good shepherd, he goes down to the bottom of the valley with you. Not so that he can kick you in the butt and tell you to get your butt in here and get back up the mountain, but so that he can pick you up and put you on your, his shoulders and carry you back to the top of the mountain. It's not your strength that's going to get you there stop thinking that it is it's his strength that's going to pick you up he will put you on his shoulders he says in himself i am the good shepherd if i lose one sheep i'll go find it and pick it up and put it on my shoulders and carry it back to the others that i left there because they were all good so don't worry about that jesus isn't going to come kick you in the butt and tell you to get it in gear he's going to come and pick your butt up and carry you up there where you need to be maybe that's what you needed to hear this morning maybe you just need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich i don't know that might be what it is. I'm not sure. But what I want you to know is that the eyes become open to the gospel. When you, when you hear the gospel, when you receive what Jesus has done, your eyes will be open. You will see the world in a whole new way. You will see Jesus in a whole new way. You will see yourself in a whole new way. It won't be the same as it ever was before. And you'll want to tell other people 
that they need to hear this, that they need to know this, that they need to break some bread with you and get into the word and understand that Jesus did all of these things so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he promises to give you. So what we're talking about this morning is slicing the bread. Slice it up. Take it one piece at a time. Take it one step at a time, just like these people did. If you're tired, if you're lonely, if you're scared, if you're anxious, if you're afraid, if you're fearful, if you're full of all of those things, sit down and have some Jesus. Get into the word and understand that he has done all of these things for you so that you can live through him. Let's thank him for what he's done. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for this little story right here about these two folks who were depressed and they were sad and they were frustrated and they were confused and they took a walk and you met them on their walk. I love that on their walk, God, that they weren't even looking for you. They were just talking and that you went to find them. Is that even you know, in and of itself? It's just a picture of the fact that you came to us to redeem us and it's not the other way around we can't get to you but you came to us god we thank you for that that you told these people how to see you through the scriptures that they didn't have to have you physically in front of them that they could see you in the scriptures and they could know you in the scriptures and that their eyes could be opened through the scriptures to who you are and they could have a greater understanding of your grace and your love for them through what jesus did at the cross god i pray that Every time your word is open, that Jesus would be revealed, that he'd jump out off the page at whoever opened it up and, and, and slap him in the face and say, hey, I'm Jesus. Did we meet yet? I, I pray that that happens, God. I pray that, that we all get a greater understanding for who Jesus is. I thank you for the message of the cross, for the gospel, for your salvation, for the sacrifice that you made so that we can live through your finished work in Jesus Christ. We thank you for all of those things in Christ's name. Amen.